looking to up your real estate investing game? Well, you're in the right place. Welcome to the Sub 2 Deals Show with your host, Sub 2 expert, William Tingle. Hey, Sub 2ers. My name is William Tingle of Sub2Deals.com. I would like to welcome you to this episode of the Sub 2 Deals Show, where we talk about all things subject to. Now, occasionally we will cover some other real estate investing topics, but it's always something to help you with your real estate investing business. Today is another episode in our Real Experts series, where we feature real experts in one or more aspects of real estate investing or on other topics that impact real estate investors. They share their expertise on things that can be critical to your success in investing. My guest today is Sharon Vornholt. Sharon comes to us from Louisville, Kentucky. Uh, her company is Innovative Property Solutions. Uh, Sharon is best known as a marketing and branding expert, but she's also a probate investing expert, and that's going to be what we talk about today. So Sharon, welcome to the Sub2 Deal Show. Well, thank you for having me, William. I'm glad to be here. Man, I'm super excited to have you here today. You know, I've in real estate for 20 years and have heard of you for a lot of those years, but we've never really just gotten a chance to talk. And with all the events and things, we've just always missed each other. So real excited to have you here today to talk about probate. Well, thank you. Okay, so now I'll tell you, just getting started here, I know very little to nothing about it. Probate's always been one of those things that... I was just really uncomfortable with, but I know that that you uh, think it's a super opportunity. In fact, uh, you some of the communication we've had, you told me that you think they're some of the best lead sources. So tell me a little bit about that and how how what's come to make you believe that. Well, William, I've been working probate since I first discovered them in 2008. And what I found at that time was uh, now I was about 10 years into real estate at that time before I discovered probates. So the thing to understand about probates is in almost every case, they must sell the property. So you're not dealing with a seller that waffles back and forth or really has a choice. So the way this works is someone passes away and then the estate is opened and then either there's a will and an executor is named in the will, that person was named by the deceased or in the absence of a will, the court appoints someone called an administrator. And jointly, they're referred to as the personal representative. They are what I call the decision maker. They are the, that is the person that can sign a real estate contract. Now, once the estate is open and they've, they've done this, they're called the letters. They, it's, it's an official document that says you have the right to sell this property. What happens next is, and this is where people get hung up, they think the property can't be sold to the estate is closed, but next in line is that the property is, can be sold and it will be sold. So roughly in the middle of the process, the property and any other assets are converted to cash, the creditors are paid, and then the heirs get what's left and the estate is closed. So that is the timeline for probates. Now, can a house ever es escape probate? Yes, they can. They can be directly inherited. For instance, you're, I'm sure you and your wife have a survivorship deed on your, on your property. So that house will not end up in probate. If the house is in a trust, then instead of coming down the state straight line of probate, it goes around and comes out the bottom. And then you still have someone that's inherited a house. So you have a possibility of a uh, finding a deal, but they would show up on an inherited list, which is a totally different list. Mm -hmm. But within probates, the, the most important fact to get from this is that those properties must be sold. They have to be sold. And the people, they're like you, you've got your podcast, your real estate business, your family, and all of a sudden you just found out Uncle Harry has made you the executor of his estate. Half the time, these people don't even know they're the executor. So they get this dumped in their lap, They've got their kids' soccer games. They've got all their regular life. And then they've got this enormous job and the responsibility of carrying it, making sure things are done according to their state laws. So are they motivated sellers? You bet they are. They just want it off their plate. Right. And they want the money they're going to inherit, which mm -hmm. if you remember the process I just told you, they're down at the very bottom of the list. So they're anxious to get that property sold. Right. Okay. So, you know, and, and not knowing much about probate, like I, I don't obviously, 
But if, okay, so let's say, let's say I'm a brand new investor. I know nothing about probate. I haven't taken any classes. I haven't bought any courses, haven't been trained or anything else. So I'm saying to myself, well, how in the world? I want to tap into probate, obviously, if they're still, you know, I've heard they're good leads. So um, where do you start with probate? I mean, do you start with the obituary? Or, I mean, you know, no, here, no, 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 no. I'm sitting here talking. I'm talking about <laughs> this and I'm thinking back to that, 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 that Ryan O'Neill movie, Paper Moon, when he would go through the obituaries, <laughs> knock on the doors and sell Bibles. So how does, how, what's the, how, where do you start with probate? Investing? Well, that is just so you know, the one thing you never want to do, because when someone passes away, mm -hmm. it might be two months, it might be a year before they open the estate. Now they cannot sell the house until the estate has been opened and the personal representative has been appointed. So you could have a family member over here that wants to sell the house. Guess what? They can't sell it till all this other stuff happens. Right. But the problem is with people, so they don't, this is one of the reason people, uh, investors don't, they shy away from probates, we'll say that. One reason is they don't know where to start. And you start with figuring out in your area where you get the leads. And this is what stops most people. There is no clearinghouse for probate leads. There are over 3,300 counties in the US and each one of those counties has a different procedure. So they are area specific. Now in my house, which I thought was, or in my city, which I thought was very old school, they're in the newspaper. Mm -hmm. Every month, every shred of information you need is in the newspaper. In a lot of areas, they're online. Now, God help you, if you live in New Jersey, you gotta go to the courthouse. Mm -hmm. Fort Lauderdale, you have to go to the courthouse. So you have to figure out um, where, what the process is for getting the leads. And what I did was I Googled it in my area. If, if they're online in your area, if you Google probate plus your city or probate plus your county, then the website will come up. If they are not online, what I did was I called my probate court and I didn't realize how incredibly lucky I was that I got somebody that actually knew the answer, but they told me, oh, they're published in the newspaper once a month called the newspaper. And that's how I found out. But think about it this way. How many people do you know that are going to go to that much trouble to find, find out that very first step? Not very many. Mm -hmm. That makes your competition very slim. Right. So the reason that probates are so good is the circle of life dictates that every month people are going to pass away. Right. It has nothing to do with COVID or anything like that, but that's just the normal course of life. So this is a niche where you will never, and I do mean never, run out of leads. Right. Never. And, and this is the way I've always been. And, and in my opinion, it's the best way to go. Uh, back when I first got started and everyone was talking about buying lists because I like foreclosures. Now, foreclosures have been, gosh, up until COVID, mm -hmm. which they, we're in crazy town right now. But <laughs> right, yeah. up until up until COVID, you know, foreclosures, 50% of our business was foreclosures. Uh, but what I would do instead of buying list or whatever, man, I, you know, I was in Georgia in the beginning, but as we started doing remote stuff, you want to get down to the courthouse and get that filing immediately with the minute it slaps the docket down there. Uh, I'm, I'm 30 days ahead for anybody that buys a list because the list has to be processed and mailed out and, and everything. So if I'm a new investor and I say, okay, I want the absolute freshest leads possible. I want it, I want it the, the absolute day that it comes out. Where do I go to get that? Well, you, you could go to the courthouse, but that's not a scalable solution. Mm -hmm. But let me just put this out there. With almost every other lead in real estate, speed is of the essence. With probates, it's kind of the opposite. Someone passes away, just stop and think of, I always mm -hmm. tell people, don't look, don't work the obituaries, don't call people, somebody's mama died. Right. Don't do, don't do that. So once they open the estate, that is the moment that they're saying, we're ready to move forward with the sale of the house. So there's no way to skip the line here, so to speak. Right. Now, with that being said, People move on their own time frame, and it's a rare bird that sells the house the first month or two after the um, estate is open. What, they'll open the estate, and the biggest roadblock that they have a lot of times is they have to clean out the house mm -hmm. because you know elderly people, if they're not they're not hoarders all of, you know necessarily, but they're keepers. 
they maybe have kept a thousand butter tubs, you know, <laughs> stocks of magazine, you know, because you right. never know when you're, when that's going to come. So they've got this enormous task of cleaning out the house. And as an investor, once you understand the process, so they, they've got a couple of problems here. One is they have a property that they have to sell that they want to get the money out of. They don't want the property. They just want the cash. Number two is they have a house that they have to clean out. And in every contract I write, I tell them that you take what you want, leave the rest, and I will take right. this burden off of you. Mm -hmm. So that moves the thing along. And then the third thing that I tell them is, is there anything else that's holding you up that I can that I can take off your plate and make this easier for you? Because I know it's a tough time for you. Mm -hmm. Now, William, they might say, uh, we owe back taxes on the house or we have, uh, my parents didn't take care of the property and they have code violations or they, they'll tell you some things, you know, like you never know what they're going to say. But then as long as you know that, you, as you know, all you do is just make your offer with that in mind. So the the opening of the estate, that's the very first tip off, so to speak. If it, if we had to compare it to foreclosures, that's the filing of the list pendants. Yeah, it's the same. It's the same thing. Same thing. Right. So, and once they open the state, the estate, then the judge has to figure out if there's a will, is it a valid will? See, there's a lot of things that go on behind the scenes. Right. Is this the real, the most current will? And if there's no will, then they have to look at however your state says, like you couldn't just have a cousin jump in front of you if your parents passed away. Right. So there's a, what I call a hierarchy. Mm -hmm. of who who is the most likely person it'll be generally a, a spouse or a child or someone like that but they have to actually appoint that person you know how you know how slow courts are oh yeah so they've got to file the paperwork you've got to get the paperwork it's so while you want to be there as soon as the leads come out you want as soon as you know that's filed there really isn't any sooner in this case so people don't have to worry about that Okay, so let's just say that uh, I've determined it's not online. I have to go to the courthouse. Mm -hmm. I'm at the courthouse the morning. They're putting out the new file. So I've got the, I mean, the, the ink's not dry on the paperwork. <laughs> uh, what's my best approach with a probate lead? Is it mail? Is it a phone call? Is it a knock on the door? What do you do? It's never a knock on the door or a phone call because I always go back and repeat these words. Somebody's mama died right. or, or their daddy. So direct mail this okay. isn't and this is a case where over the years I've, i'm very particular about this because i've heard from people over the years how upset they get to get a postcard that mentions um a, you know that there's an estate or a yellow letter they don't trust people that do that now i'm the person i think you can use postcards for just about everything but probates right but in this case you want to use a white computer generated mail merge letter that says dear william mm -hmm. and it references the their person that has passed away and the property mm -hmm. so it's a mail merge situation and you can start mailing as soon as the estate is opened and I have a, uh, in my course, Probate Investing Simplified, I have a sequence of letters. Right. So you send a sequence and it's kind of, what, if you think about it this way, it's moving them along the line with the message, I'll be here when you're ready. Because mm -hmm. they may not be ready for three months, six months or nine months. I bought a lot of houses at a year. Mm -hmm. But when they're ready, if you've done this right, you'll be the person they'll choose. Right. Okay, so you could actually uh, use... Uh, some type of CRM with a sequence in it for mailing, yes. like REI mm -hmm. Black Book or, or anything mm -hmm. that you choose to do. You can use that. And yes, and you can set it up. And then we had someone that did, did the mailing years ago in-house. So letter one always went to the new leads, letter two, but they, the mail houses can they can sort it out. You can, you can use uh, any one of those. And I will tell you this, when I, in 2008 and before, when I looked into using white computer generated letters, and they were talking with an address printed on the front, mm -hmm. uh, like in a handwriting font. Years right. ago, we used to do handwritten envelopes. Right. Um, don't use window envelopes. Don't use anything that looks like uh, junk mail. Right. But you use, uh, you do this. And when we printed them, in house because they were a dollar fifty a letter back in two thousand and six two thousand and eight. Mm -hmm. Now they're a dollar a letter mm -hmm. about or a little less, and your stamp right. is what 
what's it, 50 cents, basically? Goes up every week. I don't know what you, it costs now. You can't. <laughs> well, and when, when there was a dollar fifty stamp postage was 30, 32 cents. Mm -hmm. right. So if you figure your time, your, your toner, your everything, mm -hmm. you literally cannot do it as cheap as what you can get outsourced now. Right. And the main advantage of that is it gets done every mm -hmm. month on time. Right. I got but you. Yes, you can do it in the house. Right. So, so there's, there, there's a mailing sequence. So you don't make personal contact with these people. It's almost, it sounds like almost like a reverse of foreclosures where you actually want to make contact. Yeah, it is. It is exactly because with foreclosures, you're on a short timetable, right. okay. shorter. And these people, um, they know they've got a problem, whether they're willing to admit they've got a problem, they, right. they know it with probates. Here's the thing that I coach people on uh, when I teach probates. You have to understand the mindset of the seller and mm -hmm. then there's the investor mindset. So mm -hmm. the, the mindset of the seller is, I've got this dumped in my lap. I've lost my dad. I don't know what to do. What do I do with this golf clubs he left? You know, they're, they don't have any monetary value. See, the, these are the things that are going through their head. Or right. my mom, I don't want all her thousand cookbooks, but she mm -hmm. loved those cookbooks. Right. So they're in this emotional turmoil and they kind of have to come to grips with it. Now, mm -hmm. for an investor, they're thinking, I'm not working probates. This is creepy. Mm -hmm. I'm profiting off of someone's right. misfortune. But you can't look at it that way. And if you get really good at understanding where these people are and you get really good at listening to them, right. you can be super successful at probates because when you walk in the door and look at a house, you the first thing I tell people to do is just look around and observe what you see. If someone's dad has passed away and you see golf stuff, my, my next line after I've done the introductions and all of that is, was your dad the golfer? Oh, tell me about your dad. Mm -hmm. So there is a way that you speak to these people that it from then it's just easy. Mm -hmm. But investors and myself included, I was kind of in the worried about talking to them in the beginning when in reality if you think about someone your friend if you mm -hmm. were talking to a friend they just most of the time they want to tell you the story behind the house that's right. really what they want to tell you mm -hmm. yeah that's that, that's true uh, you know i find that with a lot of people that are in some type of distress mm -hmm. you can just ask them questions yeah, a lot of new students don't believe people will tell you what their mortgage balances are or how much their yeah. house payments are but mm -hmm. if they really need to sell and they think you can solve their problem, they'll talk, you know, it doesn't matter. That's not, that's not their most pressing problem right now, giving you some information. So yeah, I totally agree. The Sub2 Deal Show with your host, Sub2 expert, William Tingle. We'll be right back. Hey, sub tours. Do you want to learn how to get the deed, but need a little help getting started? Want to learn how to fill out the paperwork, how to use a land trust, how to market for deals, how to negotiate with sellers and more? Join us in the Sub2 Deals Facebook coaching group. Get the benefits of one-on-one -on -one coaching without the big price tag. Learn to do Sub2 right with coaching in a group setting and mastermind format. Head over to Sub2Deals.com right now and click on consulting and group coaching. We'll save you a seat. Back to the show, the Sub Two Deal Show, with your host, Sub Two Expert William Tingle. Okay, so I'm just trying to follow the, the thinking like an investor. Okay, I'm just trying to follow the timeline here. So I've got this fresh lead. Uh, I start the letter sequence, and let's just say, of course, you said most uh, administrators or, or the people running this thing didn't even know they were going to be appointed, so they don't have no idea what to do. Uh, they get a letter. So, oh, yeah, man, I need to dump this house. They call me like right away. Uh, and they don't really understand at that point that the probate process takes a while. Mm -hmm. If they agree at that point to sell me that house, can't I go ahead and get it under contract subject to it going through probate? If you get, you can buy the house in the middle of probate. Mm -hmm. Remember when that, that sale point is about in the middle. It's so long as... Remember when I said they open the uh, the probate and then they're given something, they call them the letters, the letters of testamentary. That says William is the executor of this estate. He is the person who can sign, uh, that has the legal authority to sell this house. Right. Once that, uh, once you know who that person is, right. yes, you can put the house under contract. Now, let's say I had one that took five months, one time to close because mm -hmm. 
the family was trying to do the probate themselves and they kept trying doing it in the wrong order. And I was going back, I was new at probates and I was going back and getting extensions on the contracts. Mm -hmm. So after that one terrible experience, and it's usually not that way, it's usually just like any other deal. Right. But I went to my attorney and said, what can I, what can I do? And he said, you put this in one sentence in your contract. Closing will be whatever you want, seven to 30 days, um, whatever, upon court slash attorney approval. Mm -hmm. Those are the magic words. So okay. if something goes haywire on the attorney's end or the family's end, yes, you've got the house locked up. Right. It never goes out of contract. Right. You're waiting on court or slash attorney approval. Right. That was that was always my thought on it. If mm -hmm. if probate, if the process takes a long time, how do you avoid having to go back and go back and go back for an extension on the contract? Because they may go one day, well, we got a better offer. We're not extending your contract. So exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So that's the magic sentence. Okay. Give that to and, us one more time. Yeah. Um, well, and yeah. So uh, you, I would say something like uh, closing will be no sooner than seven days, no longer than, and I usually add some time on probate, right. 40, 40, 45 days upon court slash attorney approval. Okay. Now, if they download my freebie, that verbiage will, I, there's a sample letter in there, that mm -hmm. verbiage is in the letter. Okay, great. I, I know you, you've, you've got a freebie for our listeners. I do. We're going to get to that a little bit later. So yeah, that's great. Okay. So, so we can go ahead and get it under contract. And then at that point, all we have to do is, is just wait it out uh, okay. however long. And I guess probate can vary depending on whatever uh, crazy things come up, contesting the will, doing a lot of stuff. I guess it could, it could really vary the closing date. Most of the time, I would say 98% of my deals were like regular, any other deal. They've closed. Mm -hmm. I, I t sometimes I'll put 30 days in there because I have that clause in there that doesn't really matter if something does get messed up. And um, like I said, the only problems I've ever had is when the family didn't get an attorney and they try to do it themselves. Then they tend to do things in the wrong order and then you have to start over. But in general, right. the closing, I could close most probate deals, same as any other deal, 30 days or less. Something interesting to me, we were talking before this, you said that you feel like the next 12 to 18 months uh, are going to be a really big opportunity for probate investors. Tell me why, why you think this, the, the, the coming time is going to be so, so big for investors. Well, for the same reasons you were talking about the foreclosures last March, exactly one year ago, the, the court shut down in most areas. Mm -hmm. So if you stop and think about when we were talking about the mindset of the seller, they, someone passed away and they wait however long they wait, months usually, to open the estate. Then once it gets in the hands of the court, we all know how slow courts are. It takes however long to get it through. Well, when the court right. shut down, all those people were just stopped in their tracks. Mm -hmm. Plus all the people that passed away in the past year they were in no man's land until right. the courts open. Now, in most areas, the courts are still only open about 20 at 25 percent capacity. So what right. you've got is the biggest backlog of probate um, probates in history. I've never seen wow. this in my lifetime. So once the courts get all open and I, I suspect that's going to happen maybe this summer, maybe whenever you know, people are vaccinated and things are kind of normal, then all of these probates are going to flood through the system. And there will mm -hmm. be more available um, deals than, than I know that I've ever seen in my lifetime. And another thing that's curious about mm -hmm. probates is elderly people, I have a friend who always says, if you're old, you, you're cold. And I said, Andrew, you don't have to be old to be cold all the time. But yes, that is true about elderly people. And he said, what that means is they've got a good furnace in their house. So mm -hmm. they may have put a new roof on there. They may have put in energy efficient windows to keep their heat bill down. They may have, um, you know, done, put a roof on furnace, windows, all the big things. But it's not unusual to find a house with metal cabinets and orange shag carpet. When it comes to mm -hmm. cosmetics, okay. that's that's the typical thing. Well, we don't care about that. That's our. We love to buy a house that right. has a new furnace and new roof. Absolutely. 
But yeah. that's the thing. We don't care about the outdoors. orange. Yeah, we don't care about that. Metal cabinets, we're, we're good. Carpet. <laughs> Carpet. <laughs> you know, these houses that you go in, Sharon, that when they've taken pictures off the wall, it's all these white squares all over the wall. Yeah. And the rest is like tar and nicotine from cigarettes yeah. and or, or or oil from the furnace or what. I mean, it's just, yeah, it's, it's pretty amazing. Mm -hmm. But but people think that really devalues the house. They don't understand. They just don't realize that, you know, paint's cheap, you know, and, mm -hmm. and carpet's not that expensive. So, yeah, those are small things to to fix. Great. Okay. So, yep. The next 12, you know, I hadn't even considered that. I'll, I've just been so focused on foreclosures because we did so many foreclosure deals that, that because of the court system, everything's backed up, including everything's probate. Backed so, up. Yeah. Everything in yeah. probates, but you know, it's, it is a, it's a huge backlog of probates. They're slowly right. trickling out. But then right. when it finally gets open, they're going to go whoosh and there's going to be a whole bunch of, a whole bunch of them. Right. And, you know, you really consider between the probates and everybody trying to unload houses at a discount and the foreclosures coming on the market, what that's going to do to property value. My goodness, mm, man, that, is, that is insane. So now you mentioned something about making um, sellers an offer they can't refuse. How, how do you do that? You do that by finding out what they want. The same as any deal. What do they want in addition to money? And mm -hmm. for people, let's say you have, um, I have the, there's a probate uh, in Louisville, Kentucky, and the seller is an executive. The executor is, um, is in California. Right. Is he going to want to come back to Louisville, Kentucky and wrangle out, you know, fix this house up? Or right. it may not even be a house that's that bad. Mm -hmm. it, get, it gets to be a time and circumstances problem. Right. So they've still got the same feelings about the person that's passed away, but they've got this distance. So that's a, a, a case where you can often get a house that doesn't even really need that much work, mm -hmm. but they don't want to list it on the MLS because they're way out there. Mm -hmm. Now, some, have, some properties will be listed on the MLS. That's a, that's a fact. But mm -hmm. there will be enough deals for people that add probates to their toolbox to um, make it well worth the while. Right. So, so tell me this, just a little bit of the more technical aspects there. Mm -hmm. uh, let's just say that, that you go after every probate in your county. Uh, is there any reason other than maybe location, you don't want to buy houses in this neighborhood or this kind of house, anything to do with the financing or anything that would make you look at it and say, well, that's not worth pursuing. Maybe the house was just bought a couple of years ago. Do you do, do, you do any preliminary looking at any of those things? before you mail letters or you just mail to everybody? Uh, we do. And I was, I was lucky. My, I, my daughter worked with me um, for years in my business and she was wicked fast on the computer and she would, mm -hmm. she would go, oh, mom's never going to buy over there. But yes, yeah, so it's, it's area specific. You know, we took out all the really bad areas. There were mm -hmm. some niche pockets that I didn't want to work in. And also we didn't get much uh, at, at, we don't go a lot above just straight, straight out bread and butter, or maybe the very bottom tier of the first move up house, mm -hmm. because anything that gets up there a little bit more expensive, they can be too expensive. Right. I always look at them like if you're, whether you're a wholesaler or if you're a rehabber, you've got a little bit more flexibility, but most buy and hold landlords aren't buying $300,000 houses for rentals in my area. Right. Right. So I always look at what are what are the 80% of the landlords buying or 80% mm -hmm. of the rehabbers buying because as a uh, the recent years I've been mainly wholesaling so my end buyer is always an investor which mm -hmm. takes us back to the point of do they care if they don't close for a couple months no they don't care right I and you. I double closed everything so they just said just let me know when it's when it's all through and get, call me up. So, so your probate deals, the, the, the end buyer is always an investor. So mm -hmm. you're looking in areas where typically landlords want to buy. So you can use a tool like PropStream to look for cash buyers where they're buying and really focus on those areas. I have really good buyers on my buyers list. Right. You don't need more than six or seven. Mm -hmm. If they're full-time rehabbers or diehard landlords, Mm -hmm. You don't need more than that. You just have to know where they're buying. Right. Now, occasionally I would get a house that wouldn't be in an area that they wanted. And typically that was another 
criteria for me. If it was in an area I knew that my buyers didn't like, Mm -hmm. chances are I wasn't going to go after it because right. it just got to be too much trouble. You know how when you get a brand new buyer and they'll say, well, I'm going to Wells Fargo or something, and you'll go, no, wait, whoa, 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 <laughs> or right. we're not doing that. Right. So, but it got just got too hard to train new buyers, but uh, you don't need a, you don't need a lot of buyers uh, if you know your buyers list well. Right. Gotcha. Okay. So most of your probate stuff, you're looking to get at wholesale prices. If you're, if you're in buyers going to be a rehabber or an investor. Yep. Mm -hmm. So you're looking for wholesale prices. That was the one thing uh, in the discussion we had before the show uh, that of course, you know, I didn't like was you said that we really, for, for the most part, probates, you can't use creative financing. That's what mm -hmm. we love. But yeah, you know, I've heard of a few cases and I know you mentioned there are special circumstances where you possibly can sub to probate stuff. Yes. Tell us a little bit about that. What for the listeners, uh, what are those cases where you could possibly do creative stuff with a, with a probate? So they would be cases like um, if the house were put in a trust mm -hmm. for estate planning purposes. So if it's put in a, a revocable trust, that means they can change their mind. If, so, uh, you know, irrevocable means forever. So either one of those, if, if let's say someone puts the house in a revocable trust and then they pass away, it immediately becomes irrevocable. So that means it's probate process, a straight line. It's going to go down like this and come out at the bottom. Right. So those people have inherited a house um, that they may or may not want. Now right. there's another, there is a list that you can buy called inherited properties. Right. That's where those houses will end up. And those are deals that you could do creatively mm -hmm. because they're not required to be sold for cash. Whatever right. you can negotiate with the seller is your deal. Right. Well, what about in a case where let's say Mrs. Smith passes away and she's got a property that she owes 90% LTV on, she just refinanced it a few years ago and she leaves that house to her daughter, Mary. Mm -hmm. And so Mary's going to inherit this house that she doesn't want because she lives across the country. It's fully leveraged. And so she can't really sell it without coming out of pocket, maybe for a realtor. And you, couldn't you come in there some way you could come in on that and take over the payments once she, you know, once it's gone through that process? Well, remember, it has to be converted to cash so the heirs can get what they're inher inheriting. Okay. So the only way that would work would be if Mary were the only heir. If she were the only heir and if you might be able to somehow go in and negotiate a short sale. Mm -hmm. um, if the... But see, if she were the only heir, that might be a scenario that would work. Right. Okay. Because I mean, well, like I said, I'm not, I'm not familiar at all with the probate mm -hmm. process. Um, so you're, what you're saying is everything has to go through uh, probate unless uh, in that scenario, would it still have to go through if it were just, if it were in her, in Ms. Smith's will that it went to Mary, does it no. still have to be? Not if it's directly inherited, but right. remember, before anybody can inherit anything, the creditors have to be paid. Right. Okay. So the creditors would be like the mortgage company. Mm -hmm. uh, any bills that they owe. Uh, so a lot of times, people have car payments, credit right. cards. It gotcha. would certainly include attorney fees, mm -hmm. hospital bills, and right. funeral expenses. Okay. So all those things have to get paid. Now that's why a lot of people in that situation, they will let the house go back to the bank mm -hmm. and then they will cash in the, the life insurance or, and then figure out the rest. If there is right. life insurance, sometimes there's no money to even pay funeral expenses. Right. Gotcha. Okay. Well, man, that's a lot of, <laughs> obviously there's a lot to learn about probate <laughs> and I know you do offer a course. Tell us, tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, when I, like I told you before, when I started uh, working probates in 2008, there was no information. And to say I figured it out the hard way is the understatement of the century. Mm -hmm. So a uh, couple of years ago, uh, about two and a half years ago, actually, I wrote a course called Probate Investing Simplified. Because mm -hmm. if you understand probate and the way it works, it really isn't that hard. So I focus on, I tell people, I drip the course down one module a week because I know these people because they're me to skip from point A to the to the end and do the 
I have a direct mail module and all the, I have all the marketing pieces. Right. So I am that person. So I tell them, you need to learn the middle. You need to speak the language. You don't need to be an attorney, but if, with, if they talk about letters of testamentary, you need to know what that means. Right. If they talk about a guardianship, so there's, they need to learn the process. They need to learn how to get the leads. They need to learn how to talk to attorneys. Uh, God forbid there's the, the attorney is the executor because they have no interest in you getting a good deal. Mm -hmm. And then we start to talk about marketing, about branding yourself, about websites. And by the time you come out on the end, you, you, know, you truly have all the information that you need to become, to show up as a probate investing expert and mm -hmm. talk to people in a way that makes you the obvious choice as compared to someone that knows nothing about probate. Right. So it's an all-inclusive thing. And then the direct mail module teaches them direct mail for any, any niche. It's basically, mm -hmm. here's the way, here are the pieces to direct mail campaigns and here's how you do it. And then I offer, if I'm in a full out launch, we do we do calls and in between times when I occasionally let people in, I have a free Facebook group where they can ask ask any question. And I always tell them this for a year. That's in case I get somebody. I always tell our friend Bill Walston, in case I get somebody that's a pain in the butt like you, I'm going to say, <laughs> OK, your, your, your year's up. But really, it's forever. <laughs> really, right. it's forever. I got gotcha. you. Okay. Uh, and also you've got a blog, if uh, a blog and a podcast, tell us about those where they can find you and, and learn more about it. I do. I, so I started the blog in 2010. It's uh, the Louisville gals real estate blog. Mm -hmm. And you can tell people kid me about that name all the time. I said, we knew absolutely nothing about naming things in 2010. <laughs> and the podcast right. is called let's talk real estate investing. Okay. All right. Great. And I know you promised a, a freebie to our listeners. Tell us about that, what's included and where they can get it. Yeah, they can go to probateinvestingsimplified.com and then forward slash starter kit. Okay. What is included in there is a down and dirty kind of, um, well, the road, the probate investing roadmap that tells you the steps so that you know what the steps are. There's a sample letter and then there's um, some pay, some things in there on uh, terminology and the general process. Just mm -hmm. it's like a jump start. If you um, not ready for a full course, but you need some help, then this will this will be enough to get you started. OK. All right. Great. So we'll uh, we'll have that. We'll have a link to uh, Sharon's. Uh, blog or podcast or course and the starter kit in the show notes so you guys can get that. And if anybody had any questions for you, Sharon, about any of these things or a probate question or what have you, how could they reach you uh, to ask? They can email me at Sharon at SharonBornholt.com. Okay, great. They can email me and I'm happy to answer. I'm happy to answer questions. Okay, wonderful. That's great because, you know, there's so many people that teach that don't. Uh, that you don't ever really get to even talk to them. So to find somebody that does that, that I love Well, it. and I think that that's one thing that differentiates me in my course is I always tell people, I'm not going to sell you a course and drop you like a hot potato. That's mm -hmm. not who I am because right. you can, anybody can sell courses all day long, but I'm very passionate about probate investing. Mm -hmm. I do think because um, you'll never run out of leads that it's something people should add to whatever their other favorite strategies are. But I want people to succeed. That's my right. end game. I, I want to see them succeed. Absolutely. Well, Sharon, thanks so much for, for being with us today and sharing uh, all the information about probate. We appreciate you. Well, I'm, I'm thrilled to be here, William. Thanks for having me. Okay, great. Well, Sub Tours, that is it for this episode of the Sub Two Deal Show podcast. You can find the show notes for this episode along with a complete transcript at sub2podcast.com. If you enjoyed this episode, we would love it if you would subscribe and leave us a five star rating and review on Apple Podcast. It only takes a minute and it helps others discover the show. Also, we would love it if you would join our free Facebook Subject Two group at sub2forum.com. So until next time, keep learning. Keep talking to sellers and you will buy some houses. Thanks so much for listening to this episode of the Sub 2 Deal Show with William Tingle. If you enjoyed today's episode, please leave a review and subscribe. And for more great content and to stay up to date, visit sub2deals.com or on Facebook at Sub 2 Deals. We'll catch you next time.